I want to talk with you about the critical role of person-centered care in suicide prevention. What is person-centered care? Person-centered care is really putting the person in the middle of the care. It's actually that where they are as much the decision maker as the doctor is. In fact, they make decisions anyway. So including them in that care, those decisions about what kind of care they want, how they want it, and when they want it, is actually a way to get them to engage in care because we know the best kind of care is care they're actually going to use. Now, how crazy is this notion of person-centered care? How, how, are we, how are we doing with it in mental health care? Not so good. About two-thirds of the people who have mental health problems are never going to see a mental health practitioner. So basically, our system is not delivering care to the people that need it. It's broken. So what do we do? How do we make it more person-centered? How do we make it easier for the person to engage in and keep them there in a way that they feel like they can benefit from the service? Basically, we give them choices. And for people who are suicidal, they often feel like they don't have any choices. And our system doesn't treat them like they do have any choices. We tell them what they need to do, what they must do, and what they can't do. But we don't get a sense of what they're capable of. We don't, they don't feel like they have any strengths and we don't treat them like they have any strengths. But what if we actually centered our care around making them co-experts and helping engage them around basically empowering them to believe that they can take care of themselves and their life is worth something. So what are the challenges? What, what's preventing systems from adopting these more person-centered approaches? There's three really that I can think of. One is that they're not really considered by many to be practical. Secondly, they're not reimbursable in many cases. And thirdly, there's a fear that we're not going to be able to track down persons who are suicidal that we're serving in these non-traditional methods. Uh, so let me talk about each one of these briefly. Practicality. Uh, I don't want to work 24-7. I don't want to work at 3 in the morning. If it fits at the best of the individual who's in suicidal crisis, that means that i got to be there for them at 2 in the morning. Just set up your system to make that work. We do it with crisis centers. We do it at emergency departments. That is something that is easily surmountable. It's just different than the way we've been doing things. What's the second thing? The second thing is it's not reimbursable. That's a big thing because if there are no CPT codes or, or ways in which we can go to health plans and say reimburse me for this text and chat that I'm doing for these individuals, then they're not, that we may not do it. But these are very cost efficient methods that can, that, that can actually supplement the clinic services and the other reimbursable services, which if you use them more cost efficiently, then when you see people in the clinics, they're going to get the care that they need in the right place. And you can keep the people out of the clinics who don't necessarily need it. And also keeps them more, as we would call, compliant with treatment because it's treatment that they want. The third thing is being able to track persons who are suicidal down. Now, it, it is certainly distressing to not be able to find them if we believe that they've taken an overdose or something like that. So we can use IP addresses and that sort of thing, and we can pull out those stops. But the main thing is, is that engaging them in some way, in a way that we think could work, is better than no way at all. And if that's the way they want to be engaged, this is our only shot, and let's make the most of it. Look at what you're doing well, and also ask the people that you're serving about what you're doing well and what you're not doing well and in terms of engaging them and, and giving them a sense of hope and meaning and feeling like that they're, they're a part of their treatment. So I ask them. That's a good place to start is, is really surveying your system, asking your providers and the people that are getting care or people who are inconsistent in getting care, what can we do better? If you can't do it all, and a lot of these things I'm, I'm saying to you may sound extremely foreign, they're not foreign to other partners. There are other people that are doing this kind of work locally, whether they are, are crisis call centers, whether they are mobile outreach services, whether they are, are public education services, whether they are peer-run organizations. These are all, all organizations that are expert in, in new ways and different ways, non-traditional ways of engaging people. So look in your environment and see who you can partner with. Convince funders that these non-traditional approaches that are, have a growing evidence base are reimbursable.
we should have insurance companies, Medicaid, Medicare funders basically get behind this and say, if this is the way we're going to engage people, and it does suggest that it's not only an effective way of engaging people, but also providing care that can reduce distress and suicidality, why don't we fund it? So all of these are, are, are things that we have to be thinking about. What are the strengths, what are the supports, and what are the ways in which they're comfortable in being engaged? Because it is all about engagement. We have got to bring care to people in the way that they want it. That's what person-centered care is.